That was beautiful. Well, I would like to uh, point out that if you've made it this far, then you understand all the precautions uh, and steps that we've been taking to ensure everybody's safety. Uh, when you come, we were this close to doing temperature checks, but we, we decided not to. So uh, just be, be aware that we are doing everything we can to disinfect and have the hand sanitizers. We've taken the hymnals out, and I want to thank all the deacons and elders for all their work and getting us reopened. So just be aware of that. It's, uh, it's for, your, for your safety. If you do have any questions about coming, there's a ton of information on the website, so please take a look at that. And also, if you're still watching from home and maybe you're uneasy about coming back, that's understandable. Uh, don't feel any pressure to come back. Uh, you can worship at home uh, with us, and we know that you're here uh, in spirit, and we're all worshiping together. Well, we do have a few announcements this morning, so I see a lot of youngsters in here. The nursery will be open next week, so if you're planning to uh, have your child in nursery, please reach out to Sarah Terrell and let her know so she can have a head count. Also, family camp registration is now finally open. I saw for myself it's on the website, so uh, please be sure and register. That's going to be a lot of fun this September. Also, the 2020 Media Ministry Catalog is available on the back table, so please pick one up, as well as the latest edition of Chapel News. We have that in hard copy also available, so please pick that up as well. We do have a few prayer requests. Uh, you probably saw if you're getting the emails. Uh, Gwen Phillips uh, is in the hospital, and uh, she has symptoms of COVID-19, so please uh, be praying for her and her family. Also, Margaret Smith is recovering from her uh, broken kneecap, so let's be praying for Margaret this morning as well. Well, now Dan will come up and read our scripture reading for this morning. Dan. Thank you, Seth, and good morning to all of you, and uh, happy Father's Day as well. It's... Um, Good to see you here. It's a little bigger crowd than last week, and I afterwards told uh, Jennifer and Logan that uh, it's just good to see faces here. After if I've been preaching for about two months to the air and a couple of other souls that have been here, but uh, it's great to have some of you here, and hopefully we'll be able to continue to increase the, uh, the number and uh, everybody be safe, and this thing will be behind us. But... I think our passage reminds us, at least it should, that the Lord God is in control of everything, and He has a plan, and that's what we will consider this morning as we finish our series in 2 Peter. Our text is 2 Peter chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 10 through 18, so follow along with me as I read. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Now, I take this as, uh, as a refining fire. I'll mention that, I think, in the, in the text. But that uh, the kingdom that, that uh, precedes this will be transformed. Not destroyed, but transformed, that that which is temporal will be done away with, and that which is permanent will be uh, transformed and glorified. And there's a difference, I will say this also, about this particular text among premillennialists. Um, when this is taking place, some and some very good people understand this to be when the Lord returns at the second coming. This is how he will transform the earth, and it will be regenerated, as uh, the Lord says in the book of Matthew. But, uh, and you read some of the descriptions of the event, and fire is associated with the Lord's coming, and so that's often, or by some thought, to be when this takes place. So this is a description of the millennial kingdom. I'm not taking it that way. I recognize there's reason to believe that from the book of Isaiah and other things, but I'm following the chronology of the book of Revelation and see this as after the events of Revelation 20, 
But we'll consider that a little bit as we continue our study. Verse 11, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which, that is because of this day, the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will, meet, it will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which some things are hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction." You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on guard to, so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Well, may the Lord bless this reading of His Word, bless our time together, and guide us in our thinking as we go through this great text of Scripture. Let's pray. Let's ask for His blessing on us. Father, we... T.S. Eliot wrote in his poem, The Hollow Men, This is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. We read that in high school and that line stuck with me. Not with a bang, but a whimper. Scientists agree. Since discovering that the universe is expanding at an accelerating rate, galaxies will only fly farther apart, distances will increase, space will grow emptier, Old stars will burn out and the universe will fade to night. Not too inspiring. It's like the Vikings eschatology in Norse myths in which the frost giants win, the sun goes dark, and the universe ends in eternal winter. Well, all of that is profoundly pessimistic, but the, the human mind, unaided by revelation, always leads to despair. The Word of God, on the other hand, gives hope. It's for the believer a certain hope. The cosmos, the, the world, and the universe will end. True, it will burn up. But it's a refining fire, and from the ashes, a new world will come. That's no myth. That's the future. It's revealed by Peter here in 2 Peter chapter 3. And it has an important application for us. Prophecy always does. It, it, it is intended to give us hope, and it's for the purpose of producing morality, proper behavior. Never for entertaining or curiosity, as I had said just a little while ago. Eschatology, the study of the last things, has been the subject of all of chapter 3, the second coming, and now the end of the world. Peter has explained why the Lord's return has not occurred. It's, it's not a delay. It's all according to God's plan. He is patient toward you. Peter said, toward his people and presently gathering his elect for salvation. 
But this period of waiting for us and gathering for him will not go on indefinitely. The end will certainly come, and when it does, there will be great changes. That's what Peter describes in verses 10 through 18 of chapter 3. Destruction and creation, or refinement and transformation. It will happen unexpectedly and catastrophically. That's what he says in verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. The day of the Lord is a day of doom. It's a day of judgment on God's enemies when His name will be vindicated. We read of it all through the Old Testament. In Isaiah chapter 2, verse 12, for example, we read of a day of reckoning. In 13, verse 6, Isaiah writes, Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Paul spoke of it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2, and then in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. The day of the Lord is not a 24-hour day. It's a long period of time. It's an age. And the book of Revelation puts it in the tribulation, and it seems through the millennial kingdom... In uh, Revelation chapter 6 and verse 17, he, uh, John calls it the great day of their wrath. And the wrath he speaks of is of God on the throne and His Lamb, the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. The event Peter is describing is the end of that time period. It doesn't reveal when the, this day of the Lord will occur, when it will happen. He didn't know, and no one knows. In Matthew 24, verse 36, the Lord says that no one knows the day and hour. No one knows when it will occur. Jesus said it will come like a thief unexpectedly. So we are to be ready. That's his exhortation in Matthew 24, verse 44. Peter gives the same description and exhortation here. When it occurs the universe will be destroyed. It will melt with a great heat and disappear with a great roar. That's indicated in the very sound of the word that, that Peter uses here uh, in the Greek text. It's the word roizodon, and, and you can kind of hear that uh, sense of it in the word itself. No, no whimper or bang, it's a roar with which things will end. The heavens, the stars and galaxies will be snuffed out, the earth and the elements, the, the atoms that make everything up will be burned up, it will, it will all disappear. Think of that. The, the earth and all its glories, its architecture, its art, its literature, the wealth of nations, the, the natural beauties, the mountains and oceans, and all of that will be destroyed. The world will end in flames. In verse 12, Peter says that the elements will melt with intense heat. Literally, the, the elements will be made liquid. You wonder if Peter wasn't unknowingly describing nuclear fission in which the, the energy bound up in all of the atoms will be released in this roaring explosion across the cosmos. His description certainly fits with our understanding of thermonuclear reaction the word destroyed is literally loosed or uh, break, break up or broken up. And, and that fits, it seems, the splitting of the atom. But that, I'm speculating uh, on these things. The world, though, as we know it and its history, will end in a kind of universal holocaust. And this fiery termination, this fiery end, measures the real value of our present age. 
Nothing is going to last. There are moral implications to that. There, there always are in the New Testament and in the, well, in the Bible. There are moral implications to all of the doctrines and all of the things that are taught. And certainly that's true in this case. And Peter makes the application in the next verses. That's really the emphasis, I think, of this passage. How are you going to live in light of all these, of these, of these facts that I have just set before you, he's saying. Verse 11, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? What are you building for? Where are you laying up your treasures? The Lord talked about that in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. They don't last Moths eat them. Rust destroys them. Thieves take them. You can't preserve them. Now, there are lots of illustrations of that and lots of sort of monuments to the truth of that. And so things that occurred to me are some things that I've seen over the years of my life. I think of the, some of the ancient ruins that I've visited. Delphi in Greece, for example, is a beautiful place. It's the site that the Greeks chose as their sacred place, and they built temples there. And the cities of Greece had what they call treasuries there, buildings where they put their treasures. And so one of them that still stands there is the treasury of Athens, which is a wealthy city. But it's empty. Not a coin or a pearl is left in it. You can go into the ancient tombs of Egypt. You can visit the pyramids. You can go up into them and go into the burial chambers, which were filled with the treasures of the pharaohs at one time. You can visit their graves in the Valley of the Kings, and they're all empty. Now, one of them has some treasures in it, that of Tutankhamun, but uh, that's the only one that they found with the treasures. But you know what? He doesn't enjoy any of those things. So if they're not taken away, you're taken away from them. Worldly investments don't last. And ultimately, this world won't last. We all know that. No one doubts that. But the reality is we don't always live like that. We live like this life is just going to roll on forever. Since it won't, since our life won't, and since this world won't, since it will all melt, since the glories and stories of this world are going to be destroyed, don't store up your treasures here. That's a word of the wise to the wise. The world is going to burn up. That's the instruction of, of this text, and it's something that... Uh, we need to bear in mind, it's a, a, a truly awesome picture, even a little unsettling as we read this, maybe even a little frightening, but we're not to be worried about it, we're not to be afraid at all, we're, we're just, to, we're to be the opposite, that's what he's giving here. This is something for us to be encouraged of, something, something better is coming and we're to live for that. There's a positive side to this, in other words, and that's the instruction that he gives in verse 12. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which, that is, because of this day, the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. He kind of repeats the point to make the point very clear to us. This world is not going to last, and so don't live for this world, live for the next. And he says, looking for this coming and these events. Now, that doesn't mean we're to be spend our time looking idly up into the sky. That's uh, what the disciples did when the Lord ascended from the Mount of Olives. You remember that. Luke wrote of it at the beginning of Acts in Acts chapter 1, verse 11. The Lord goes up and they see him ascend until he's taken up into a cloud and they're standing there looking, which I think if I'd been there, I'd be doing the same thing, just staring up into the sky until he 
And they did it until the angels who were there told them to stop doing that. Quit looking up into the sky. They said, he's coming back in the same way that he left. In other words, he's coming back physically on the clouds to the earth. In the meantime, they were to get to work. They were to be active. And they got active. They went back to Jerusalem and they started doing the work of the Lord. That's the book of Acts. So Peter is not, is not telling us to do what he was told not to do. He means be hoping for and anticipating the Lord's return and living in light of it. We're to be hastening it. Uh, that strengthens the idea of, of looking for it. And it doesn't mean that we can in some way and the things that we do speed up the schedule of the Lord, uh, in, influence His plan in some way, but we can work in concert with God's will to carry out His plan. And that's what we are to be doing. In that sense, we, we have a part in the Lord's return and the concluding events of history. In Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, Peter call, calls people to repentance so that, as he says, the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Presently, God is bringing His people to repentance. When that work is done, the Lord will come. That work is done, though, largely through evangelism. And in, 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 in that, we, we help this day draw near. We are part of that plan in bringing it to pass. So we are to do that. We're to be engaged in that. And we're to be engaged in prayer. We're to be praying about it. We're instructed to do that. The Lord instructed us to do that in, in what we call the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10. Pray for His return. Thy kingdom come. We're to be looking for it and praying for it. Paul did that. He did that at the end of 1 Corinthians. Maranatha, he says, which means, O Lord, come. John prays at the end of the book of Revelation, Come, Lord Jesus. It's to be a burning desire that we have. It's so easy to get caught up in the things around us and not think in those terms. But that's the apostolic way of looking at life. Come, Lord Jesus. So we have our part to play in that, and, and certainly we are to be longing for it and living in light of it, because as Peter again says, the elements will melt with intense heat. But the universe will not be left a kind of burned out cinder. Fire, as I've said, is uh, refining fire. It is a means of forging or transforming this, old universe, uh, this present universe, this old universe, into a new universe. One reclaimed from the ashes of judgment, purged, free of all sin and its effects. That's our hope. Paradise regained, which was promised by the Old Testament prophets, in Isaiah 65, verse 17, God said, Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. This is all going to be a forgotten dream, as it were. And here in verse 13, Peter repeats that. He says, We are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. This is not a description full of description. About all he tells us about it is, it will be new, which is something. And he says it's a place in which righteousness will dwell, and that tells us a great deal right there. But the main thing he says here, as well as that, is it, it will be new. And the idea is not new just in terms of time or chronology, but also in character. It, it will be fresh. That's the idea unused, new in respect to its form, so that the new heavens and new earth will be completely different from what we know, unlike this old universe. And that is 
just in that word new, a, a kind of compelling description. It, it, and I, what I mean by that is it sort of excites the imagination. It's a significant description, but still one that lacks detail. And yet, you think about it, that's consistent with the way the prophets describe things. I say the prop, well, the apostles and prophets. Paul tells us about the resurrection body in 1 Corinthians 15. He, he says it will be a heavenly body, that it will be imperishable. He calls it spiritual. All of this in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 40 through 44. Now that tells us a lot, but it doesn't reveal an image to us. We can't say, oh, I, now I see what it's going to look like, what we're going to be like, what our form will be. But it doesn't tell us that because such things are really beyond our comprehension. I think that's how we're to understand that and this, the resurrection body, the new heavens and the new earth, all of this is so great that it's beyond our ability to comprehend. It's beyond words. So the, the brevity of description is really an encouraging thing. Is what it's saying is you can't begin to conceive of how great and beautiful and magnificent this is. It's beyond our experience. There's, there's really no analogy to be made. Look, look, that shouldn't surprise us. We can barely comprehend the present universe. We're always <clears throat> we're on the always on the verge of discovering something new and contradictory. And a resurrected universe, well, that's well beyond us. It will be, as I said, and as Peter says here, a place of righteousness. And that means it will be a place where we will be truly free. We will have none of the encumbrances and burdens of sin and guilt and and difficulty that we have in this world, we will be free of that. We will have true, unlimited joy. That, that's our future and that's our hope. And in fact, as I consider this and contemplate it, I think the joy, and this is probably well short of the reality, will only increase without any interruption exponentially throughout all eternity. Our knowledge, our joy, our love, all of these things will only increase without end, without limit. That being the case, that's what we should live for and invest in. A glorious world that's coming, a world of righteousness and freedom and real joy and happiness. That's what Peter urges us to do in the rest of the chapter. In verse 14, he tells us how we should live in in light of the Lord's coming, be diligent to be found by Him, to be found by Him when He comes in peace, spotless and blameless. In other words, our, our character and conduct should be the opposite of that of the false teachers. This is the reason he wrote this letter in the first place, because of these false teachers. And you'll remember back in chapter 2 and verse 13, he described them as being stains and blemishes. What will Christ find in us when he returns? That's a sobering question. Because everyone is going to be found by him when he returns. No one can hide. The day of the Lord is a, a period of time. It will come as a thief in the night. And it will begin with the Lord's return, with the rapture of the church, which will be unexpected. So what Peter is saying is we're to be ready, always. As Peter says here, since you look for these things, be diligent. Christ's return is a, a strong incentive for godly living. All of this, the, the end of that age, that, that period, is an incentive for godly living. It should be. That's why it, it is important to believe it and to look for it. Live expectantly of it. False teachers had ridiculed all of this. They ridiculed the idea of the Lord's return, and said that, uh, and certainly the kingdom and the new heavens and the new earth, that's all 
Ridiculous, they said. Everything is going to continue on as it always has. It's just, look, things just don't change, they said. There's no judgment to come. Forget the prophets. Look at this world. It just doesn't change. And so in verse 15, Peter reiterates that, that, what we, that, that what may appear to be a delay by God is really his patience. This is what he spoke about earlier, but here he repeats it. He, he has, he's provided a lot of time, the Lord God has, for his plan of salvation to be carried out. And, and it is presently being carried out in the calling out of this world of his people. God is, is like the, the father in the parable of the prodigal son. In fact, that parable is really about the father in Luke chapter 15. The son left the family for a life of pleasure in which he squandered his wealth and his energy. But the father was patient with him. He didn't give up on his son. And, and one day the son returned, beaten and repentant. And the father received him back immediately with joy. Now, what kind of story would that have been if the father had lacked patience and love? Well, it's a story we never would have heard. It's a parable that would have never occurred in the Bible. As it is, it is a, a parable about God, the father, and his love for his elect. He is patient toward us. He's full of love and mercy. So in this period of patience... We are to be active in the work of the Lord, in preaching the gospel, teaching the gospel, living the gospel, being a witness in the midst of this age, bringing Christ to the lost. Peter is not the only one who taught that. And he brings in the support of Paul at this point. He writes, just as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, wrote to you. It's not clear what text Peter means here. Maybe Romans chapter 2, verse 4, where Paul writes of the, the riches of God's kindness and patience that leads to repentance and rescue from the judgment to come. And all through Paul's writings, he spoke of eschatological events and the need to live in light of them. He, he calls the Lord's return the blessed hope in Titus chapter 2 and verse 13. But what's interesting in this reference to Paul is that it shows that Peter and he, Peter and Paul, kept in touch with one another over the years. They followed one another's ministries. You might think, well, yeah, they're apostles. They would do that. But you also should remember that years earlier in Antioch, Paul rebuked Peter to his face. Peter needed it. He had wrongly refused to eat with the Gentile converts there in Antioch when Jews from Jerusalem arrived. Paul refers to that in Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 21. What this reference indicates is that... Um, that incident didn't cause a breach in their relationship. It speaks of the, <clears throat> the great maturity of Peter. He responded well to the rebuke that Paul gave to him, and here he calls him our beloved brother Paul. And I think he understood that in the fullest sense because a loving brother rebukes another when he or a sister needs it. And here he indicates <clears throat> that Paul's writings were widespread and inspired. They were written according to the wisdom given to him. In other words, not according to Paul's own wisdom, but according to God's wisdom. The, the, the things that Paul wrote weren't simply Paul's thoughts and ideas. He was given wisdom, and Paul wrote according to that wisdom that was given by God in his grace. So... Peter endorsed the divine origin of Paul's writings and, and indicates that the church did. They were widely known in Asia Minor. That's why Peter appeals to his authority. What's also interesting about Peter's statement here regarding Paul's letters is what he says in verse 16. 
where he confesses that uh, there are some things hard to understand. That doesn't mean that Paul wasn't clear. It means that the, the subjects are deep. They're, they're complicated. They're not easy. And so that takes real effort to understand the things that Paul wrote. If, if, if we're not careful in studying the New Testament and studying the writings of the apostle, we can misinterpret them. So this is a very human touch, I think, which gives some encouragement to us. Uh, we would all agree, if we're honest, and we spend much time in study of the New Testament, in study of the epistles of the Apostle Paul, that there are some things hard to understand in him, and maybe many things. And if an apostle admits that, we don't need to be ashamed to admit it as well. But this also carries with it a warning. Some of Paul's statements are distorted by the untaught and the unstable. They twist things. The word also means torture. They torture things. Inquisitors do that. Inquisitors torture people to get them to say what they want to hear. And uh, bad interpreters do that. They torture the Bible to get it to say what they want it to say. They read their own ideas into the text rather than let the text speak to them. I read a biography recently on F.F. F. Bruce, who uh, died in 1990, I believe it was, a great British scholar. Some of you have perhaps enjoyed his uh, commentaries and books. Profound uh, man. And he loved the scriptures because they spoke to him. And they should speak to us. We don't speak to them. We let them speak to us and guide us. Well, false teachers don't do that. They torture the text. And Christians, good Christians, naive though Christians, can do that. Uh, that's a sign of immaturity. It, it's not easy to study. It takes a lot of energy, brain power to do that. I don't mean you have to be a, a smart person to it, but you, 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 if you're going to be a student, it takes time and discipline, and it's not easy. It takes effort. And if we're not willing to put that kind of effort into study, then we'll end up with some odd ideas. Dr. Johnson used to recite a, a rhyme or a verse that uh, he'd heard somewhere. Marvelous things in the Bible we see, things that are put there by you and by me. Well, we're all guilty of that from time to time. We, we need to guard against that. But this is particularly true of false teachers. They twist Paul to support their heterodox teaching, their false, distorted teaching. We know that from, for example, Romans chapter 6, verse 1, that uh, Paul dealt with this very thing. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? That was the accusation that was made about Paul's teaching, and he answers that. May it never be. God forbid. The greatness of grace is seen in light of the sin that's forgiven. Just like the greatness of a person's strength is seen in the, the, the greatness of the weight that he or she w would lift. And in the previous verses... In Romans 5 and verse 20, Paul says, Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And what he meant by that is to see the greatness of grace in the greatness of the sin that it deals with. No sin is greater than the grace of God. And that's a marvelous thing. God's grace is greater than all our sin and, and has dealt with it. But some people were saying, Ah, see, Paul, what... what what you're saying leads to certain things. Now, it's not certain who he's referring to, who he's quoting in that passage. It may be antinomians, that is, people that are against the law, people who think there's nothing that controls our behavior and we can live whatever we want. And so they seized upon Paul's idea of grace to have antinomian ideas and propagate that. I'm more inclined to think that what he's doing there is quoting the Jewish opponents to 
his teaching, and they're saying, if that's true, Paul, then that leads to a life of sin, and we may as well go sin to the full, because then we'll only be increasing the greatness of grace, and that disproves everything you're saying, Paul, because that's not the way we're to live. Either way, what Paul was teaching about the grace of God was being distorted and, and, and being used improperly. And not only that, Peter says they do this kind of thing with all of Scripture. The rest of Scripture, which shows how extensive their distortion of the Bible was, these false teachers. But, but what is especially significant about that statement uh, is by saying that they distorted Paul's writings and the rest of Scripture, Peter put Paul's writings in the same category as all of Scripture. He's saying the rest of Scripture means Paul's writings are Scripture as well. And, and this shows with certainty what I said earlier, that Peter considered Paul's epistles to be inspired Scripture. That gives us um, an idea, I think, of how <clears throat> the, the canon of Scripture, the 66 books of the Bible, were combi compiled in, in the early church. The, the Old Testament was already compiled, but the New Testament was put together in much this way. The, the, the uh, Apostle Peter gave approval of all of Paul's writings, and he was understood to be an apostle anyway, and so people understood that these writings from an apostle were scripture, and they put them together. There's more to it than that, of course, but this is part of that. Now, Peter concludes his epistle with um, a warning to avoid error, and then he gives an encouragement to grow. The warning is given in verse 17. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men, like those men that twist the things that Paul wrote and the rest of Scripture, that you not be carried away by them and fall from your steadfastness. That's quite a warning. Fall from your steadfastness. That, that indicates that we are never out of danger. Even the steadfast can fall. Now, what he does not mean is that they can fall within their steadfastness. The, the word is fall out of your steadfastness. In other words, we can drift away from it, and then we do fall. Well, think of Solomon, known for his wisdom. At the beginning of his reign, 1 Kings 3, verse 3 says, Now Solomon loved the Lord. He was a young man. He'd been given great wisdom. He loved the Lord. Then at the end, 1 Kings 11 verse 1 says, Now Solomon loved many foreign women. He fell into idolatry. Even the most mature must always be vigilant maintain their steadfastness. That's Paul's teaching. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. But we can progress in the faith very well if we're obedient and we're in the Word of God, which is to say we can't progress very well if we aren't. And if we're worrying about the negative all the time. We need to hear the negative. We need to hear the, the warnings of Scripture. But we need more than that. We also need the positive, And that's what Peter ends on, a positive note in verse 18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. In other words, growth is possible. Steadfastness is possible. Development to the glory of God is possible. Growth keeps us stable, and, and we grow through the study of Scripture. It's that simple. We feed our souls by the Word of God. You're feeding your soul right now through the, the reading and teaching of the Word of God. 
I, I cannot emphasize that too much. I know I sound like a broken record about this. You've heard me say this many times, and I keep saying it, and I'm certainly trying to live it myself daily. We grow through the study of the Word of God. And so we all need to be students of the Word of God. Some have a greater advantage in that, having gone to seminary or being in a position where it's our work to, uh, to study. What a blessed work that is. But we all need to use our time wisely and study the Bible. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, he wrote, Like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the Word, so that you may grow in respect to salvation. That's the way you grow. Faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. There's no standing still in the Christian life. We must always be growing, progressing in our knowledge, and walk with Christ, who is God. He's God the Son. He's the second person of the Trinity. He is Lord, and Peter ends by saying, the glory goes to Him now and forever. What glory is that that he's speaking of? Divine glory. Peter began the epistle by affirming Christ's deity in verse 1. He ends in the way he began. Christ is God. He's equal with the Father and the Spirit. In essence, attributes, power, and glory. Therefore, he is worthy of our worship, worthy of our obedience. That is required of us. So may we live our lives for him for His glory, not our own satisfaction. That's wisdom. Listen, it's always wise. It's always smart to obey God. He has the final say in everything. But it's also wise because this world is coming to an end someday. All agree, whether a poet or a scientist or a Viking, this world will end, not... Because that's just the natural order of things. It's just, uh, what, entropy. It's all just going to run down someday. That's the way it is. No. Because there's a plan. And, and it's wise to heed that plan and to follow it. To know that things are coming to an end because God is in control and He's moving things toward that end, not in a pessimistic sense, that shouldn't give us a pessimistic outlook, but a hopeful outlook because what He's moving everything toward is a glorious, triumphant conclusion, and we're a part of that if we're believers in Jesus Christ. So Peter asked, since that is true, what sort of people ought you to be? The answer is godly people, obedient and active people, obedient to Christ who is coming back to establish His kingdom on the earth and bring about the eternal state, the new heavens and the new earth. Have you recognized Him as Lord and Savior? If not, you are still living independently. At least in your mind you are. You're living for the moment. You're living without a care for the future. And that means you don't have this hope that is present here in this passage that we've studied. Whether the end comes with a roar and heat or with old age and death, the end is coming for all of us. The only way to prepare for that is to look to the Son of God, the Savior. Christ died for sinners, took their punishment in their place so that all who believe in Him would be saved. Trust in Christ. Be saved. And know that the future is not bleak, but glorious and eternal. God encourage us with that. And encourage a right response. Well, let's close in a word of prayer, and in the prayer, let's prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper and a time of worship. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this book, this brief book by the Apostle. What a, a great 
opportunity it is for us and great privilege to be able to read it and study it and reflect upon the dangers that face us today with error that is prevalent. There's nothing new about that, what the, the, the error that we have in our day. It's been in every generation. There have always been false teachers that have distorted the truth, and there will be to the end. We thank you for the wisdom that is communicated to us through your word, and I pray that we will heed the instruction that the, that the apostle gave, and, and in the positive sense, we will look and hasten the day of our, your Lord's coming, your Son's coming, and our Lord, and that, uh, that we would be obedient in the meantime, serve him faithfully. Lord, we thank you that he's coming again. We thank you that he came 2,000 years ago. He entered into time and space and into human history. He became a man and he died in our place. And as we reflect upon that in the moments to come, we pray that you'd bless us, sanctify us, make us more like Christ, give us more and more of your mind. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Elizabeth. We have a wonderful Savior. This is wonderful to be with you and to see you this morning now around the Lord's table. What a, a privilege to enact in the way our Lord asked us to uh, these great truths uh, that we've heard this morning from the Word of God and now in song. But we've heard this morning uh, much about looking, uh, looking for a coming day with a kind of eager anticipation. In the Lord's Supper, we remember and we celebrate uh, what God in Christ has accomplished in order that we might look forward to such a day and not fear it. The Bible says it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That is because of sin and the consequences of sin before a holy and just God. But the Bible also says this, a reading from Titus chapter 2, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men and women, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. And here it is again, looking, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. And as we partake now of the bread, we understand the meaning of his words when he said, take, eat, this is my body given for you. It is that he gave himself, in the words of uh, our passage that we just read uh, out of Titus, he gave himself for us to redeem us. He offered him up his own life as a substitutionary sacrifice for our sins in order that uh, the holy wrath of God against every believing sinner might be satisfied in him and we might receive forgiveness and the gift of eternal life. What a blessing. So we invite all of you uh, this morning who are present with us either physically or at home uh, live streaming and who have received the gift of salvation by faith alone in Christ's person and work alone to partake now of the bread, mindful that the Lord Jesus instructed us to do this in remembrance of him. And in this way, as you know, we proclaim the Lord's death until that day, that day when he comes. And we are, as our passage this morning has proclaimed, we are found in him in peace, spotless and blameless. Let us now give thanks for the bread. Father, how grateful we are 
for this bread, which is a reminder to us that you sent your son into this wicked world, uh, the holy and righteous one. He came to do your will, and he did it perfectly without wavering at great cost, at great sacrifice. He gave himself to redeem us. And so what a cause for joy. What a cause, as we've been reminded this morning, for right conduct, for an eye toward you always, living our lives in your presence. And as we partake of this bread now, we remember him and we anticipate eagerly his coming again. We pray in his name. Amen. In 2 Corinthians 11, Paul lists what he suffered for the Lord in giving the gospel. It's really an amazing accounting of things, and it doesn't even cover all of the difficult events in the apostle's life. But he writes of the beatings, times without number. He said uh, that he experienced imprisonments floggings, stoned three times, shipwrecked three times, one time a day and, the night, and a night in the deep and the, in the sea, drifting. All kinds of dangers that faced him on his travels from thieves and robbers, from the Jews and the Gentiles alike. The, the list that he gives is long. And as you read it, you might wonder, how do we explain such devotion to Christ, such a life of sacrifice. Well, it's not fanaticism. It's not the explanation. That's nothing uh, of an explanation for the life of the apostle. The explanation for his devotion, his sacrifice, is love. He loved the Lord. He spoke of that earlier in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14. That explains the life of an apostle. For the love of Christ controls us, he writes, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. Paul understood what Christ had done. When he said one died for all, he meant Christ died as a substitute for sinners. On the cross, he took our place in the divine judgment that we deserved. As a result of that, all died, meaning... His death counted as our death. It's like saying, he paid the debts for all. And all are now all paid up. We are debt free because of what he did on the cross. And he did that for all of his people. At the cross, Christ did what the angel told Joseph that he would do before our Lord's birth in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. He saved his people from their sins. And he did that by dying in their place and suffering the punishment for their sins so that they, so that we, so that all believers in Jesus Christ would not suffer for those sins. They've been suffered for already. Now that affected Paul completely. He saw in the cross the greatest demonstration of love there is. The perfect Son of God, the sinless Son of God, bore our sins in our place and removed them as far as the east is from the west. And so he said, the love of Christ controls us, meaning the love that Christ has for us, the love that Christ has for me, controls my life. Understanding Christ's love for him and how he obtained forgiveness for him and eternal life for him moved Paul to serve Christ from gratitude. Not just duty, though he had the duty to live an obedient and active life, but he didn't do it from duty, not duty alone. Mainly, he did it from gratitude and love. If you want a life of devotion to Christ, then learn of him 
Learn what he did for you by becoming a man and dying in your place. The more we understand him, the more we will willingly be controlled and constrained by him. That's why we take the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Why we remind ourselves every week of who he is and what he's done. It has an effect upon us. We learn of him. And learning of him, we want to serve him. Out of love for him, as the apostle did. Well, let's give thanks for the cup that speaks of the blood that he shed for us. Father, we thank you for the sacrifice of your son and what it cost you, what it cost the Trinity and his death in our place. As we understand that, may it compel us to live a life for him, a life to your glory, a life in great service. Thank you for the death of your son. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for willingly coming into this world to die for us. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, that concludes another Sunday service. It, uh, again, it's so good to see all of you here and uh, be with you. And so I hope you have a great Father's Day today and just a good day of, of rest and reflection. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for your goodness to us here. Rich, rich blessings you've given to us in your word that we possess it and in your providential care of us. I pray that you'd watch over us over the week. I pray that as we leave, you'd, you'd give us all safe journey home. You'd keep us healthy. Thank you for all that we have in Christ, that we have everything in him. We have your protection and your love now. And you're going to keep us until we enter into the glories to come. Thank you for what your son has purchased for us. May we live lives that honor you. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. In Christ's name, amen. Until next week, keep looking to the Lord. Goodbye.